What's going on? This is Chris Van Vliet, and you're watching Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. The Casanova Podcast, the number one podcast in Hawaii, is brought to you by these contributors on Patreon. If you'd like to see more content like this more often, as well as more podcasts, reviews, impressions, early access releases, live streams, and original content, then consider becoming a patron today. All right, and welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikhail Casanova, and I'm excited to bring you today another amazing interview. And today's episode is going to be with the one and only Chris Van Vliet. Now, anyone who's a wrestling fan, anyone who's into entertainment reporting, you know this guy. This guy is phenomenal. He's been a YouTube sensation for years. He's a four-time Emmy-winning entertainment reporter for Deco Drive on WSVN Fox 7. And he's a massive WWE and wrestling fan all over, as well as an entrepreneur. He's got over 61 million views on YouTube. It's insane. And the man just went over 125,000 subscribers on YouTube. Hats off to you, man. That's an amazing accomplishment. But with that being said, let's go ahead and introduce Chris Van Bleed onto this amazing podcast. And we're in. I got the whole custom intro, video, prepackaged, promo, WrestleMania style. I had to run it right before we did this. How's it going, man? It's uh, I'll it's do been, great. Has it been a year? It's been. I think it's been a little over a year since you were last on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think a little over a year. So, uh, you know, thanks for having me back on. It's good to see you're doing well. Uh, yeah, I, and, and congrats on everything. Thank you, man. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, it's uh, an honor to have you back on. And welcome, everyone. This is the Casanova Podcast, Hawaii's number one podcast. Four years in a row now. And uh, I we, we, we truly have the honor of having the one the only, the amazing Chris Van Lee, man, it's 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 an honor having you back on, bro. Like you have been doing such amazing stuff lately. I mean, just it, you know, you launched your podcast, you've been killing it with the interviews. You know, you signed with AEW, bro. How's it going? <laughs> Things are going well, and I have to thank you on the podcast front. You, you know, you really inspired me to kind of start to do that thing on my own. You know, YouTube was mainly the sandbox that I was playing in for a long time, and I started to realize that maybe I should be putting the audio versions of these interviews out there for people to be able to check them out as well. So thank you for helping me, you know, kind of nudge me in that right direction. And my podcast turns one in June, so... Things have been good, man. I, I'm, I've just been excited to be able to work on a whole bunch of different things. Nice, man. Nice. And yeah, like, um, dude, you, you, um, with, with your podcast, like, it's on all platforms, and you've just been killing it. Like, how is it, it, it? Your experience with jumping into podcasting, what has that been like for you so far within the last near year that you've been doing it? It's. So, I mean, I've, I've been on YouTube uh, or had a YouTube channel since 2011. So, like, I've had my, like, claws kind of dug into that for a while, been able to really figure out what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. With podcasting, I'm still very much a baby, you know. My podcast <laughs> is nine months old, and I'm kind of repurposing the interview from – or the audio from my interviews and putting it on the podcast. So. Mm -hmm. It's been it's been different, man. It's been a whole new beast, but it's been exciting to be able to dive into that. I, I always say the best thing about podcasting is anyone can have a podcast. Yeah. And I always say the worst thing about podcasting is anyone can have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's cool that you can go out there and do it. Um, but, you know, it, it's tough to make yourself stand out, as you know. But, you know, you, you've, you've been able to crack the code and figure out a way to do that. 
Man, I no, man. I, I'm looking to you. You've been you your your show has been showing me a lot of things that I need to be doing better. But it, it's like the the whole world with podcasting, like you know, being on YouTube for so long and then transitioning over to that. Like a lot of people that I know that are content creators on YouTube, they keep telling me like, "Hey, I want to I want to start a podcast. I want to bring my audience over." And I tell them it's a different beast entirely. Oh, yeah. Like it you got to get your audio right. Like one of the things I've done from the last time that you were on the show till now is, you know, I, I got a smart uh, sponsorship and partnership with uh, go XLR or to get an audio interface and road hooked me up with this mic. And I'm like, okay, I got the better equipment. Now I need to up the production of everything else. And it's like, I try to make it seamless with taking the video version of the podcast and then pulling the audio or if I have to throw in, you know, sponsorships or whatnot, it, it's a lot of work. And, and I think a lot of people don't realize how much this goes into that. Oh, and it's definitely a labor of love yeah. as well. And I think that people think that, uh, you know, you start a podcast and then you wake up the next day and you're Joe Rogan. Well, that's, that's <laughs> how this thing works. Uh, it's, it's a labor of love and, you know, most people are never going to make a dime podcasting. Yeah. So I think that you need to go into this knowing that it's, it's a thing you enjoy. You know, it's like, it's like playing basketball at the YMCA, you know, you're doing it cause it's fun and you enjoy it, but you know, an NBA scout's not going to be sitting there, you know, signing you. What's really helped my podcasting experience is I signed on with a great podcast network i'm with blue wire which is one of the premier sports podcast networks yep. so they've really helped kind of guide me on this path and you know they set me up with an incredible editor and producer who makes my show sound very very good and that's the most important thing if your show sounds like garbage people are just going to assume that your show is garbage yeah yeah very true and you know i, w I want to ask you about um you know, when it comes to doing your interviews, like, dude, you've got like sometimes like five to six interviews a week. Like how? Well, I know with the whole uh, COVID-19 situation, you're not able to travel as much. But, you know, when it comes to booking all of these interviews, like how are you managing? Like, are you dealing with a lot of different time zones or are most people centrally located near you or? How's that process for you? Is it, is it tiring? I know it's tiring for me <laughs> sometimes. It's a lot, right? It's it's a lot of juggling what's going on. But I'm one of those people that like very much lives and dies by what's written in my calendar. So mm -hmm. like you know, this example, this uh, this interview that we're doing right now, for example, it was written in my calendar. I knew this was happening. <laughs> I knew it was happening, you know, today. So I, I treat the other things in my life that same way. If, you know, if, if it needs to happen, I write it in my calendar and then it does happen. Yeah. Okay. And um, with uh, the process of, um, you know, with your shows, you've been uh, doing putting up, uh, you've done some live stream interviews on your YouTube channel as well. How has the process been for you streaming uh, on YouTube? That's been a brand new beast for me to <laughs> tackle. And I, I use the same platform that you're using right now, StreamYard, which has been you know so helpful and makes it a pretty seamless process. Yeah. But I think the thing for me is that that's where the time zones really factor in because the audience that watches my YouTube videos are all over the world. And mm -hmm. I try to find time slots that work for everybody, but you really you can't please everybody. So I was doing them at like one o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time, mm -hmm. but you'd barely be waking up, <laughs> you know. Uh, everybody in uh, Australia is it's the middle of the night there. It's like two or three in the morning. Yeah. So it's like, I guess we can only, you know, make the people happy from like California to London or something, you know? Yeah. So that was, that was kind of the, the tough thing about it. And, and the nature of those conversations is I feel like those, those live streams that we were taking a lot of uh, fan questions, they were less of a conversation and more of just like, Hey everybody, we're all stuck at home. Let's make the best of this. Let's hang out. Yeah. It's really great that you've been able to improvise too, because I know, like before the whole, you know, the global pandemic broke out, like, dude, you were all over the place, like interviewing, you know, celebrities and wrestlers and all kinds of people, like all over the world. How does it feel for you now? Like, uh, are you able to relax more that you know you're at home, or are you still just, you know, on top of it? Well, I mean the. 
the good thing, and I guess also the bad thing about the situation we're in right now is we're all in this together. We're yeah. all experiencing, you know, the same thing together right now. So I was a big proponent of doing my interviews in person. I love to be able to look that person in the eye, shake their hand, mm -hmm. eat off of their energy. And even if it just made my interviews just 1% better, I, I wanted to be able to take advantage of that, even if it meant flying across the country and, you know, renting a car and driving some more once I got there. But, you know, I, I, I saw the writing on the wall mid-March that this was going to be a thing. And at that point, you know, we were in lockdown for, we didn't know how long. Mm -hmm. and I just went, look, let's, let's try to make the best of this situation. So I pivoted and started figuring out, okay, how can I even do these <laughs> things? I, I've never recorded an interview ever on my computer. So uh, I've been very much a student of the game and it's been, it's been a process you know, it's been a process. <laughs> and, and the only way you can learn is by not getting it right sometimes. So, you know, the audio, I have some audio issues I've had some connection issues, but you know, if you're not, if you're not winning, you're learning, right? Yeah. And, and definitely like, I know like with uh, doing everything remotely, especially for me, like I'm still learning you know, how to utilize this XLR mic and utilize an audio interface. And sometimes when I record, like I'm clear, sometimes people are like, you're super quiet. Sometimes my audio is distorted. And it's like, some people told me, they're like, how do you like not get embarrassed and just stop? I'm like, because you only get one chance sometimes and you just got to roll yeah. with it. You know? Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. You, you, you just have to go with it. And life, life isn't perfect. Right. So why should, your live podcast or your live YouTube video be perfect. You know, it yeah. won't be. So I think that you just have to roll with it and learn along the way and try not to replicate those mistakes the next time around. Yeah. yeah. So other big news with you, man, you, you signed with AEW, bro. How has that been? <laughs> yeah, it was really cool to be able to work uh, that first show on TNT, to be on Dynamite, you know, <laughs> For the first time, they had wrestling on TNT for the first time in almost 20 years. It was yeah. so cool to be a part of that. And, you know, I think if you blinked, you'd miss me on the show because I was just in that one segment. But, man, what a cool thing. And that, that truly is a dream come true to be able to combine the two passions that I have, the passion for broadcasting and the passion that I have for pro wrestling and kind of combine them together to do one thing. So, man, it was exciting. And AEW's, you know, every week, week after week, doing something new, doing something exciting. And I think that it's been a great thing for the wrestling business as a whole. Yeah. I mean, rising tides lift all boats and everybody's had to up their game. And I'm not just talking about WWE. I'm talking about everybody, Ring of Honor, New Japan, um, MLW, NWA. Um, they've all had to up their game. So it's been really exciting to kind of watch this thing from inception to where we are now. I mean, definitely, like, with, um, I think for a lot of the, because the, I, I know we, we we talked on this the last time you were on the show, like, there's a significant difference between, like, the wrestling fan and the WWE fan. And I think, definitely. I think for, you know, people being able to see that, you know, there's another mainstream wrestling promotion out there with AEW that's giving you options. I know there's some of the diehard WWE people that say, Oh, I'm WWE or nothing, but it's like, it's good having options. Everything needs competition. You know, it, it, it's iron sharpens iron and being able to have AEW, new Japan pro wrestling, you know, impact WWE MLW. It's just, we've got, Oh, even, um, 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 NWA, you know, just, yeah so much options available right now. I feel like as a wrestling fan, I'm like, can I watch everything within a week? <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, man. Like there's never been a better time to be a pro wrestling fan. We talked about that last time too. Yep. And it's, it's just, it's really exciting what's going on in the world. And, and you're right for too long. There was only one real voice telling you what mainstream pro wrestling looked like. And yeah, it's changed so much. AEW coming in has really changed it for the independent circuit too. So, man, 2019 was an exciting year yeah. in pro wrestling. As soon as things start getting back as normal as they can be, uh, I'm excited to see what 2020 has to bring. Yeah, definitely. And, and speaking of like, you know, with the changes in the wrestling landscape, 
you know, how do you think it is for, uh, you know, for professional wrestlers right now performing in empty arenas? Like that's gotta be such a, a, a odd feeling because, you know, that energy, that live energy feeding off the crowd, like those moments are, you know, no pun intended. Those moments are electrifying for a wrestler. How do you think they're coping with that? Well, I think that, it's exciting to still see that wrestling is continuing because yeah. this tiny little sliver of normalcy that's happening in the world right now when every other major sport is canceled or postponed. So I appreciate that. But I interviewed uh, Hurricane Helms the other day and mm-hmm. he said, having wrestling without fans is like having a stand up comedian go on stage without a crowd. And that was the most perfect analogy I've heard. Like, Your jokes could be incredible, but if nobody's there to laugh at them, you know, how funny are they really? So I think that what we're seeing right now is WWE and AEW and Impact Wrestling's doing as well. They're continuing to put on shows, which I super appreciate. I'm super grateful that we have that to consume. But I think that this is going to be like an asterisk in the history books when we look back on this time. Hopefully, you know, it ends soon and hopefully everyone uh, can recover from this but i I think it's going to be an asterisk that we look at and go yeah but that was during that era you know like because so much of wrestling is feeding off that crowd and i don't just mean like knowing that you know this is a great promo or this is a great finish to a match it's knowing when something's not working and being able to call an audible in the middle of a match and go yeah i know that you were supposed to do this thing i'm going to do that thing now let's you know let's go from there and that's not happening right now. Yeah, it's um, you know, it's 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 definitely weird as a fan. Like when I saw you know Steve Austin come back on Raw and he did his whole spiel, like his whole his character feeds off the the audience and hearing him say you know give me a hell yeah or or what you know it just it felt weird you know just not having that audience you know, just respond, but he, he worked with it. I mean, he didn't, he, he, his face was stone face. He didn't change. I was like, man, that's, that's a professional right there. I couldn't oh, that's do a it. true professional. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel for the guys like Matt Hardy or Brody Lee who made their AEW debut, you know, to an empty arena. I yeah. feel for the guys like Drew McIntyre who finally, after yeah. years and years and years of hard Chosen work, one. <laughs> You know, wins the big one, wins the championship, and, you know, there's no crowd reaction. So those are the moments that, you know, that we like to play back. Like, my favorite match of all time is Rock versus Hogan. The thing that made that match was so so great was mm-hmm. how good the crowd was. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, we've seen some upsides of, of what they've been able to do without a live crowd, which is kind of crazy when you think about, you know, the the boneyard match and you think about the firefly funhouse match like that this situation literally forced wwe to do something creative and I, i'll be honest i didn't see them doing either of those but they did it and i i was like wow that was good <laughs> yeah and i think when we all saw the initial reports that wwe was going to do some cinematic style matches we all kind of like collectively rolled our eyes yeah like, Oh, that's going to be terrible. They ended up being the most entertaining matches of WrestleMania weekend. So I think we're all going, oh, okay. Look, (laughs) desperate times call for desperate measures. And we are most certainly in desperate times right now. Completely unprecedented what's happening right now in the world. So I think WWE went, well, let's try it. And if it works, great, we can run with it. And if it doesn't, we just won't do it again. And I, I, I appreciate them stepping outside of the norm, giving these a try. I think under any other circumstances, these would not work. Yeah. And I think that when things do go back to normal, whenever that happens to be, I think that these will just be you know, a nice thing that we'll remember from this time. Yeah. Uh, we got a, a question from the audience. We got a question from Jake Miller. He says, uh, and it's for you. So what types of gimmick matches can work for AEW, kind of like the WWE working a match in their headquarter office area? Hmm, Yeah, that's what they're doing in Money in the Bank this weekend. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a a good question, Jake. And I I don't know if I want to see AEW do those style of matches. Like that very much has 
uh, WWE's fingerprints all over it. This is their thing. This would be akin to like AEW doing a Hell in the Cell match or yeah. something. I think we'd all kind of look at it and go, that's, I mean, you're calling this like rage in a cage, but this is clearly Hell in a Cell. <laughs> So I think that if AEW did those style of matches, it would just be like, I don't know, it would feel like they're trying to rip off the thing that WWE has kind of coined during this time. And yeah. uh, as exciting as it could be, and I think that we could come up with a whole bunch of great ideas, like the fact that Daly's Place, where they were doing those live shows in Jacksonville, is right next to where the Jacksonville Jaguars play, TIA Bank Field. Mm -hmm. You could have an entire match in this football field and going around and everything in there. So I think that there, there's certainly a lot of possibilities, but I'd be very, very surprised if AEW went down that path. Definitely. And, um, you know, one of the other things too, is like with the, you know, there's been the, the recent string of uh, wrestlers that were let go from the WWE. And a lot of that was a surprise, you know, it, it I, really didn't see a lot of the people that they let go being let go like i know you did your interview earlier today well it, it debuted earlier today with zach Ryder and and you know I, I what do you think went into that do you think it's just the lack of incoming revenue that was going on or just i i think that's exactly it I, obviously i'm not close enough to the situation to know exactly what's going on there but I think you had a combination of a few different things. One is they generate a ton of money from their live events yeah. and from the merch sales at live events. Well, that's, you know, their income from that right now is zero. Yeah. So I think that they had to find a way to make up for some of that lost revenue. Uh, I think in the case of Zack Ryder, his contract was ending in August anyway. So mm -hmm. they released him in his the 90 days will come up in like the middle of July. So they basically released him a month early. So I think mm -hmm. that you had some situations like that. I think you had other situations like the revival who were basically begging to be released, chomping the bit yeah. to get released. So and then, then I think there's situations like, uh, like Kurt Angle, who was working as a producer and hurricane who was working as a producer where it was just like, Hey, we just don't have anything for you right now. And I think that you'll see a handful of these guys be employed again within the next year or two when things kind of do flatten out and become normal again. Okay. Uh, we got a question from uh, one I seen in 3D. He said, question for Chris, what elements of other promotions would you be interested to see AEW implement? Hmm, that's a good question. I like that. I, look, I've always been a, such a big fan of New Japan and New Japan's style of wrestling. Mm -hmm. So if we could see that fast paced, that that strong style wrestling worked into more matches, I, I think that that's not something we see a lot in American wrestling. So I think that if we could add that in, man, sign me up for that. I also think that AEW will benefit from having um, more exposure, um, you know, adding on another show uh, when that eventually happens, mm -hmm. because they've got a, a great roster filled with incredibly talented men and women. Yeah. And I think that there's unfortunately only so much time in a week right now. They have three hours, two hours on dynamite, an hour on dark and yeah. three hours to showcase all that talent's not enough. So I don't know if they need the 77 hours of wrestling a week that WWE has or whatever they have, <laughs> but maybe another, maybe another hour or two for AEW would be a really nice thing. How many how many shows does WWE have? They, okay, so they have Raw, SmackDown, uh, NXT, NXT, main main event, three hundred five <laughs> live. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's kind of crazy when you think about how much of a monopoly WWE. And I'm not saying that in a, a bad way. You know, it, it yeah. happened because of the whole WCW going under. But when you think about how much of a monopoly they've had on the wrestling industry and with them having almost all of the top wrestlers in the world, but th there comes a problem when you have everyone on your team. Yep. And it's like, it, you know, you look at it in terms of like football, you got your first string, second string, third string. When you've got everybody, you can only put so many people on the field. And I think that was, that was the case of what we were seeing. Like, you know, you got in WWE. Now you've got Bobby Lashley, you got Ricochet, you've got, you know, Kevin Owens, you've got so many great talents, and yet 
yeah. you see certain storylines and it kind of just makes you scratch your head. Like, I, I personally, personally, I am a huge Bobby Lashley fan. I've been a Bobby Lashley fan since he debuted back on SmackDown. And he's actually physically, like, as I'm working out, I've been using a lot of the tips that you told me from working out from the last year. I've, I've dropped, Good. dropped 65 pounds. Oh leaning. my god. Dude, I've wow. been doing keto, leaning out, Congratulations. cardio. I'm just I'm trying to get super cut, but then I'm like, I want to get big like Bobby Lash. I mean, I got the ball head now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you look great. But hey, thank you. But it's like with, with um Bobby, I'm like, I've seen how they used him on his first run. I saw how he was used as a destroyer in TNA Impact. And then as he came back, I'm like, okay, we're finally going to get Brock versus Bobby. And they didn't do it. I'm like, what is going on? Like, I, I'm just, I don't understand it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, like, I think there's always going to be at least one storyline going on at any given time where we all kind of shake our heads and just go, yeah. What is, why is, why is this the thing? Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's just wrestling for you. Yeah. You know, it's it's really cool though. You know, seeing, not, even though it's unfortunate that you know so many of the wrestlers were let go, like it opens up so many more doors for them to go somewhere and go to another promotion and be able to continue, you know, their dream of of being in a professional wrestler, but also having some form of creative control over their characters or what they would like to do. Because you know, case in point with uh, John Moxley, you know, yep. current AEW World Champion having the ability to, to go and, and and have that freedom on AEW that he couldn't have as Dean Ambrose. And it's it's really amazing. Like I'm really happy for the guys that are able to, you know, not only go somewhere else and shine, but go somewhere else and be happy. Because honestly, yes. if you're going to work, do something you love and, and be somewhere that fosters that love of what you do. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. And it's and it's, it's an exciting time to be not just a wrestling fan, but it's an exciting time to be a wrestler, too, because there's options. If you and I were having the same conversation 10 years ago, it was you signed with WWE. Yeah. Maybe you signed with TNA. I mean, possibly you did some work for Ring of Honor. But if you were an independent wrestler and that was your only thing, man, it was tough to make a, a real living. And it was Cole Cabana and the Young Bucks that really kind of changed the game there yeah definitely definitely so with um you know speaking of like certain returns that we never thought we'd see cm punk coming back and you had the interview with him where he said he will never ever 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 (laughs) and then yeah well is he he's is he really back though true 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 you know yeah, uh, it's it's cool to see him on programming talking about wrestling. Very curious though if we'll see him in a ring. Um, and I interviewed Will Ospreay last month, and he kind of floated it out there to CM Punk that he'd love to have a match with him at the Tokyo Dome mm-hmm. in January. And CM Punk was basically like, sounded like he was game for it. So I think that if he were to ever come back, that actually might be the perfect scenario for him. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if he if he does come back, I would love to see him properly, you know, utilize and and going to be able to you know wrestle his full capacity and, and and have some creative control over his character because I feel like with Punk, you know, he he's so great when you just let him do his thing, you know, he's yeah. he's such and that that's a a skill that I feel like a lot of wrestlers, if they would just be allowed the opportunity to develop and, and become their character, you know, I think it would go so far. I just, I do have concerns if he were to go back to WWE and just be on the roster again, I do. I'm afraid of him not being utilized properly. You know, he's, he's done well, so much. Yeah. And I think that, I think that if he did come back, and this is complete fantasy booking what yeah. you and I are talking about right now because yeah. who knows if this will ever end up happening. <laughs> I think if CM Punk does come back, it's got to be like a Brock Lesnar type of situation yeah. uh, or an Undertaker type of situation because if he's on every single week, if he's on Raw, 
and SmackDown or just one or the other every single week, by about like week four, you're going to be like, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen him. That's cool. And I think that that's what makes it so exciting when The Undertaker comes back because yeah. you never know when he's going to come back and you never know how long he's going to be back for. And same with Brock Lesnar. Yeah. And that's the other thing, too, is like a lot of people see, I, I, I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, on Twitter and the dirt sheets and whatnot, a lot of people hate that Brock Lesnar only shows up every so often. But to me, I'm thinking that's kind of the prize fighter type of booking. You know, you want that mystique of when this guy shows up, you know, somebody's getting wrecked, like something's going down because like he's, you know, seeing every single week that loses its luster. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, it's Monday. I know who I'm going to see this day. So. Well, nobody gets upset when The Rock does that kind of booking and nobody gets upset when John Cena does that. I would have to think, though, that the, the argument against that is Brock Lesnar is basically coming in winning the title <laughs> and taking it away from guys who, you know, might be more deserving of it. And I think that I can understand that, but Brock Lesnar's a draw. Brock yeah. Lesnar does big numbers and he has in UFC and he will continue to in WWE. So I get it. I understand it. I think a lot of it probably comes from jealousy too. I mean, everyone wishes they could work that kind of schedule. I think the other thing too, like uh, I've had some discussions with friends uh, in regards to like the booking of Brock Lesnar, why he continues to get the title over and over and over. I'm like, well, one, he's a legitimate badass. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah. like this guy, he he looks like he can just. Well, I mean, yeah, he's he's brick house. But the other reason I feel like is because a lot of. Um, WWE hasn't allowed a lot of the wrestlers to build that star power organically the way that, you know, wrestlers in the Attitude Era and the, the Ruthless Aggression Era were able to do. Like, a lot of it, it's very scripted. I mean, we've seen it with the whole Suffering Succotash stuff. And then when, you know, remember when Cena, he actually, he, told, he dug into him and he just let him come out. I was like, ooh, that's the Roman I want to see. Like, it... it <laughs> I would love to see Roman just do his thing. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's I understand why Brock continues to get the title because it's 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 a different era and it's Vince, but it's a different era. Well, Brock is a hell of a worker though, and I think that if you need an example of that, just watch his work during the Royal Rumble. Yeah. That was really really impressive. Yeah. And on top of that, like obviously Brock looked dominant for a lot of that match, but Brock can sell mm -hmm. probably better than anybody else, except for maybe Dolph Ziggler. But, <laughs> you know, the way that he sells is incredible. Like he's a he's a great performer. And I feel like people forget that the guy can wrestle. Like when if when Brock needs to work, he will put on a show. Yep. No, he uh, he's great, and I think that. When you turn on the TV and you're a casual fan and you see Brock Lesnar, you go, oh, my God, Brock Lesnar's there. If you know nothing about wrestling and you turn on the TV and you see Brock Lesnar, you'll go, oh, that guy is exceptionally large. Um, <laughs> like, like, I, I, I understand this. And I get it. I get that that's the appeal that he has. Yeah. Speaking of Dolph Ziggler, he is a phenomenal, phenomenal wrestler, phenomenal in the ring. Why, in your opinion, I don't want to get you in trouble, but in your opinion, why have they not pulled the trigger with him? Because I've been a Ziggler fan since he debuted, and I don't understand it. I'm like the guy, he can wrestle, he can sell, he's good on the mic, he's got charisma. He's like Shawn Michaels on, on, on like another, he just going Super Saiyan or something like that. Like, the guy is freaking phenomenal. I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> yeah, and I'm with you. I'm a huge Dolph Ziggler fan, and I think that he, pound for pound, is probably the most talented actual worker in the ring, like actual yeah. wrestler in the ring. And, and it's not coming from me. This is actually coming from Dolph. He basically said, if I was four inches taller and you know, 30 pounds heavier, heavier, I'd be the champion like six times. That's true. You know, Dolph Ziggler, I think, was just behind the curve by like, six or eight years uh and i think that uh, you know it's just unfortunate that he was coming up in the mid 2000s instead of coming up in like 
2012 or something because he would have been an absolute rock star if he came to NXT at 26 yeah. or 24 or something like that. And I think the thing was he was already in the system for so long. Fans already, you know, were accustomed to the character that he had. And you know, he was relegated to mid-card to like sometimes main event status, but mostly that mid-card status. But man, he's so supremely talented. He's an incredibly nice guy. Yeah. And I know that anything he does, he's going to do well. Like, look, Dolph has been the world champion many times. He's, yeah. He's held almost every title in WWE. It's not like he's had a bad career if you look at it on paper. But if you know his career, you look at it and go, man, there was just the potential for so much more. I mean, I also feel the same way about Zack Ryder, like another phenomenal talent, you know, wrestler and, and athlete and someone who's, you know, given so much to the business. And it's just, you know, I remember when he won the Intercontinental title, I was, man, I was up screaming at the TV. I was so happy. And then the next night I'm like, WWE, what are you doing? <laughs> Yeah, well, look, I think that he's going to have a real chance to shine, whatever yeah. happens from here. So yeah. he's 34 years old, and he's supremely talented, 15 years of experience of being on TV with WWE. I think that uh, we're going to be talking about Zack Ryder, or Matt Cardona, yeah. uh, in the next year or two, you know, in the title picture for the title in some company, whether that's AEW or Impact, Ring of Honor, maybe New Japan, I don't know. But I know that wherever he lands he's going to instantly be in the main event picture. Yeah. Man, it just makes me mad. Like, between, like you and, and, and Zach Ryder and myself, we're all in the same age range, but I'm the one with the baby face here. I don't look, I don't look my age. <laughs> Dude, that, that's a good thing. No, it's not. That's a good thing. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. You don't, you, you want to look older? Yes. I want to look, that's no. why I'm trying to grow facial hair. It just, Oh my God, no. Dude, my audience, no. they roast me. They're like, hey, baby face. I'm like, I'm a grown man in my 30s. Like, no, you're a baby That's face. A, that, that is a badge <laughs> of honor. You should wear that, my friend. <laughs> uh, we, we, got a, we got a question from Chris Levi, 13, in the chat. He said, question for Chris. What do you think of Edge's amazing return, and when, his, when do you think his next match will be? Well, Chris, first of all, Great name. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think that we all got goosebumps when we saw Edge's return. I, I get goosebumps just talking about it right now. And the look on Edge's face when he came through that smoke and kind of looked around, I think that that said it all. That was yep. exactly how we all felt. And I felt a little bit bad for him with that WrestleMania match. Um, you know, I think that the match with Randy Orton – didn't exactly receive the best reviews. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, in my own personal opinion, it was way too long compared to what it could have been, but mm. I felt bad because this was his moment. This was his comeback after being away for so long. This was his WrestleMania moment now. And they were doing it without that crowd reaction. And I just felt like, Oh man, this, I really feel for edge. And I wish that this moment could have been done on a bigger scale. Yeah. Uh, as for when his, Next match is going to be, man, that's a great question. And I think that they're purposely keeping some talent off TV because of what's going on right now. So I don't know his situation personally, but maybe he's not working because, you know, he doesn't want to be traveling because he has some, you know, very young children. Yeah. Uh, and, or, and I think that maybe that's the situation. So I don't know. This is me just speculating. <laughs> speculating. Uh, but, if it was me, I'd want to see Eddie back in the ring as soon as possible. Give yeah. him an actual match with Randy Orton. I'd love to see that. Yeah. Man, when he came back at Royal Rumble, man, he looked... I feel like that was the best he's looked in his career. Like, yeah, I agree with you. Chiseled. I was like, that's Edge? Wow. <laughs> yeah. 46, I believe, looks amazing. Yeah. Oh. Um, let's see, we got a question from Jake Miller. He says, uh, what WWE roster member could benefit most as a talker if given the more edgy limits AEW talents have on the mic? Like a current WWE person? Uh, well, let's yeah. just run with that. Yeah. I, I think the answer is everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but I think you touched on it a little bit. Like when when we saw Roman Reigns, kind of like they they let the leash off of him for like a promo or two. We mm-hmm. all went, oh, like he can actually cut a great promo. So yeah. I think that someone like him, who we've seen in the main event, we've seen cut promos for years and years and years, and the promos have all kind of been like, yeah, okay. I think someone like him, if they just said. Hey, go out there. This is how a lot of the promos work in every other promotion. They go, hey, we're going to give you eight minutes. Mm -hmm. You need to cover this point and this point. Go. Whereas WWE goes, all right, here's – I was looking for paper to really really emphasize my point here. Here we go. (laughs) WWE goes, all right, Roman, uh, here's your script. And – have this memorized by uh, your segments at uh, 927. All right, we'll see you then. You know, and, and I think that that's the biggest difference. Like, if you stop, if you think about that, like, if they did that with The Rock or with Stone Cold or Taker or, or Mick Foley or Triple H back in the day, they never would have made it. Well, they probably did that at first. I mean, mm-hmm. don't get me wrong. You have to earn that. Like, yeah. I don't think that you walk in on day one and they go, all right, Rocky Mayavia, yeah, go for it out there. See what the <laughs> fans think of you. I think that, you know, it's scripted at first, and then they start to give you a little more freedom as you start to prove for your, prove it for yourself. But you're right. That's what made those guys in the Attitude Era so great is the <laughs> reins were off, and they were able to, you know, really showcase their true characters. Sure. We got a question from one I seen in 3D. It's a question for Chris. How would you, you got, you have a lot of fans here, man. <laughs> this is, thank you guys for hanging out with us. This is awesome. <laughs> you said, uh, how would you book Dolph if he made the jump to AEW? That's good oh, that's great. Well, I think you slide him into the main event picture immediately. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think that he could, uh, I think that he could work an incredible matches with Chris Jericho. Mm-hmm. And I think that, look, I'm going to list every, anybody, and he's going to have a great match with anybody because he's Dolph Ziggler and could have a great match with anybody because that's how good he is. Yeah. But I think you could slide him right into the main event picture with John Moxley, and those guys could go to war and have some incredible 20 and 30 and 40 minute matches that we would never have seen in WWE. Yeah. Uh, Dolph Ziggler is, this is obviously fantasy booking because I don't <laughs> think Dolph Ziggler is leaving anytime soon. Um, and, you know, he survived this most recent round of cuts. So, I think he's at this point pretty Teflon. Yeah, it, it was shocking seeing Kurt Angle be cut, but I, I get it. But I was like, Kurt, that, really? Well, he had also only been under contract for like about a year, mm-hmm. so I think that that was under the Legends contract, the producer contract that he had. Mm-hmm. So I think that probably factored into it. Okay. So uh, switching gears, one of the questions I do want to ask you about is. Um, have you, how, how was your recovery from getting the 20 chops from Sean Spears <laughs> and from, from Tyler Breeze? Dude, I saw like, I'm looking at the thumbnail now and I'm like, oh, that's brutal. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'll, I'll put it out there and you didn't exactly see this in the video, but it, it was my idea. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I knew that Sean Spears and Tyler Breeze had this wrestling school in central Florida and. I said to Sean Spears, I said, I want to come in there and I want to do a segment and let people know about your school. Anytime, man, the door's open for you. So I made a trip to Orlando mm-hmm. and we we did this segment and I said, look, I want to get in the ring and I want to take some bumps. I want to lock it up. I want to run the ropes. And and he goes, well, how about at the end? I, I, I chop you. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, like one chop, that's, you know, that's, that's fine. I said, why don't we just line up all your students? And have them all chop me. And he's like, oh, are you sure? <laughs> I'm like, sure, why not? I mean, it'll make for a great video. Little did I know that at Flatback Wrestling Training, everybody gets two chops. So I started doing the math, and I'm like, well, there's eight students, and there's two of you guys times two. Oh, my <laughs> 20 chops. <laughs> my chest healed up relatively quickly but like that night it was red and purple and welts everywhere the next morning i woke up and the bruising had started to come in so black and blue a little bit a little bit of red some yellow from the bruising 
uh, yeah, it looked like someone had taken like spaghetti sauce and just like thrown it on my chest the next <laughs> day. But I don't know, like six six days until it was fully healed. Okay. Yeah, because I I watched the video and I was like, oh my god, like ugh. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, it didn't tickle, that's for sure. <laughs> so 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 I have to ask, like, how was chest day when you worked out, having that that kind of pain? Oh yeah, it was tight. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think I waited a few days to do chat. I waited like three or four days, but oh yeah, like it was just tight and tender, like to the touch. We're good now, but it. Uh, I yeah. <laughs> I'm glad though that Sean Spears at least said, "All right, you can get me back." And I, I chopped. I chopped him twice. The first one was not very good, and the second one was eh, like a four out of ten. <laughs> So, um, you know, you, you got to interview Nick Aldis, uh, the NWA World Heavyweight Champion. And, um, dude, like, let's, let's talk about Nick. Let's talk about NWA, like, how yeah, they're doing sure. something different with studio wrestling. Like, I know a lot of people are not used to or maybe weren't, you know, weren't around for when studio wrestling was the thing. I know Mid South Wrestling was doing studio wrestling, I want to say, all the way up until, like, the early 2000s. I remember... When I lived there, you know, my parents used to take me in the, the 90s and late, you know, late 90s and, and early 2000s to see studio style wrestling. And it's a different beast, but man, they work with it there. Like they're, they're very good at bringing that to life. But what was your experience like when you got to, to go there and talk to Nick and talk to Billy Corrigan and, and see the, the, the people there? Well, the crowd is so hot there. And like, it's, it only seats like 300 people, but it's like 300 die hard wrestling, die hard NWA fans. And <laughs> that's what makes NWA power so interesting. And Billy Corgan said it best. He said, if we went out there and did a show with, you know, the, the big ramp and the lights and the guardrails, it would look like WWE light. And we don't want to look like WWE light. We want to look like something completely different from that. So NWA already has that lineage, already has that history behind mm -hmm. it. So why not start to lean into that, but with a bit of a modern flair? And I, I actually, unfortunately, think that they're the ones who are, you know, hurting the most from the, the current COVID-19 pandemic because they haven't been able to continue their shows. So... I'm so excited for when they come back because they were riding this massive wave of yeah. popularity and their YouTube channel was exploding. So I, I, they can't come back soon enough. And, you know, things are starting to become closer to normal in Georgia. Yeah. Uh, and, and they obviously, you know, film in Atlanta. So maybe we see them back to normal sooner rather than later. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Knock on wood. Yeah. <laughs> um. With uh, and we can touch on uh, Impact Wrestling, you know, with uh, when Tessa Blanchard she made history, she won the, the Impact World Heavyweight Championship. Like, that was I don't think anyone saw that coming, but that was that was monumental right there. Like, yeah, dude, what did what, you think of it? <laughs> I've been backstage at a few Impact shows recently, and man. They have some great in-ring talent, like some great matches that are happening right now. Just unfortunately, you know, they don't have the they don't have the channel, the network to mm -hmm. have everyone see it. Um, but man, there's some of the best wrestling in the world right now is happening on Impact Wrestling, and Tessa Blanchard is one of the best wrestlers in the world. And I and I and I'm not pre prefacing that by saying best female wrestler in the world, just one of the best wrestlers in the world. Period. Yeah. And if anybody were to win the world heavyweight title, uh, it'd be her. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that that doesn't matter if she's a man or a woman or mm -hmm. otherwise. She's so deserving of it. And it's unfortunate that she hasn't been able to defend the title, um, although it's been cool that they brought back the old TNA belt. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that was, I loved that belt and I loved <laughs> the history behind that specific belt. So that's been a cool little twist here, but I think that, and I keep saying this during the interview, I'm sorry, but I'm so excited for things to go back to normal so that <laughs> we don't have to have these caveats with everything. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully sooner rather than later. Cause it's, uh, are you getting to the point where it's like you're, well, 
Probably not because you you have your 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 calendar. But like, do you ever have those moments where like the days are starting to like blend together, or you're losing oh, track yeah. of time? Because it, it didn't seem that bad at first, but now it's like, what day is it? <laughs> yeah, and at first it was like a nice little break for everybody. Yeah, like. And I think that no matter what industry you're in, you know, whether you're a parent or you don't have kids, whatever you're doing, like your life up until that point was probably pretty go, 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 probably pretty busy and filled with different events and, you know, different places you were going. And then all of a sudden, just like out of nowhere, they just like kind of slammed on the brakes. And I think at first, like the last few weeks of March there, I think we all kind of went, oh, this is nice. Like this yeah. is a nice little break. But I'm so just so ready, like I'm so ready to be done. And I think what the toughest thing about this has been is we don't know when it's done. Like yeah. if on March 16th, they said to everybody, all right, this is going to sound crazy, but we need you to stay in your homes, but it's only for six weeks on May 1st, everything all back to normal. We'd all go, Oh, okay. Like I get it. Yeah. You'd start booking all your, you know, different things and travel May 2nd and onward. But instead, this feels like it feels like you're going on a run. It feels like you're running along, and you're like 10 minutes into the run, and you go, so uh, how much long are we running for? Ah, just keep going, man. Just keep, I'll let you know. I'll let you know when you're done. So like 10 more minutes or like two more hours? Just keep it going, <laughs> man. You're doing great. That's what this feels like right now. Because we're going, hey, man, we've been doing this thing, and it's great, and we've all been staying at home, but how much longer do we have to do yeah. this? There comes that moment of, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say my heart goes out to, you know, the healthcare workers that are working so crazy and working the crazy amount of hours that they are to keep us safe. My hat's off to everybody who's staying at home and staying safe with this. But I just think it'd be nice to have a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Yeah, as I know um, with my old team at the hospital I used to work for um, is absolutely insane for me because I, I left uh, Hawaii Pacific Health September of last year to pursue uh, podcasting, YouTube. I, I remember I, I texted you about that. Yeah, and, um, congrats. You know, I left at that time, you know, a couple months before COVID-19 hit and it's crazy finding out like i recently found out about two weeks ago like my entire former team uh in telecommunication because a lot of us we we well all of it actually we had to go into the hospital rooms to do the networking and wiring and everything setting up the phones and whatnot um my entire whole team caught COVID 19 you know and i was you know i talked to my wife about that and i told her like every time i think at times when like oh stupid for quitting my job the other thought hits me like i dodged a serious bullet yeah so you know i wow. my heart really goes out to everyone who you know the first responders healthcare workers and also to the people who are essential workers you know i, I know a lot of them that are having a, a difficult time right now i i personally feel like if you're an essential worker and you're having or even, you know, medical as well, if you're having to risk your safety to, to, you know, to work and provide for yourself and provide a service, I, I honestly feel that they should be compensated a little bit more than what they are. Hmm. To, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's just such a tough time right yeah. now. And, you know, I think that I think that it's not fair when people say, oh, we're all stuck at home right now. Well, a lot of us are. But there's also a good section of people who are going to work every single day. Yeah. Um, you know, they're like you said, first responders or they're healthcare workers or they're just essential employees. Yeah. And you know, that's a that's a tough situation to be in. Yeah. So we got a couple of questions in the chat for you uh, from Fangirl98. She wants to ask uh, Chris, who do you think deserves to be in the Hall of Fame next? that's not in there now. Well, when is the rock going to be put in the hall of fame? I mean, that's, yeah. that's a given. Uh, I really want to see Eric Bischoff. And I think that that's one that will happen eventually. Mm -hmm. Although when I interviewed him, he's like, yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. Well, of course it's going to happen. Eric yeah. Bischoff, 
has done so much for the wrestling industry. So I think that uh, we see Eric Bischoff in there. Obviously, The Undertaker, but his career doesn't seem to be done yet. So yeah. I guess you know that's that one's a. Uh, but that that's a lock. Look, that'll that that's one that's going to happen eventually. Yeah. Uh, All Spark Warrior ask. Um, see, his question is: Let me find it. Where did it go? Did it go? Oh, okay, there it is. What are the challenges of doing what you do, Chris? Oh, where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the one of the biggest challenges is my my YouTube channel, my podcast is guest driven. So it's navigating that whole process. And, and you know, you know, you're very familiar with this as well. So it's it's navigating that whole process of trying to get someone to say yes. Mm -hmm. Then when they do say yes trying to work with their schedule and figure that whole thing out. I'd say that's the biggest thing because when it rains, it pours, you yeah. know, and oftentimes you have more guests than you know what to do with. And then there's sometimes when you're like, I don't know what my next episode is going to be because I can't seem to make anything work. So I'd say it's, it's navigating that and trying to figure out, you know, how to get content yeah i mean especially when it comes to like what we do with interviewing you know various people it's i know a lot of people like i've had people say you know the stuff that we do we make it look easy yeah because you're seeing the final product but yeah, the behind yeah. the scenes you know scheduling uh you know dealing with different time zones their availability like you said you know what platform but, but, are you doing <laughs> Then on top of that, it's the editing and sometimes converting video and yeah, and syncing the audio, uploading it to YouTube. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, like, you know, there's many, many hours that go into an hour long interview. Yeah. Um, as far as like, um, you know, during this pandemic, what's your workout uh, routines like? Like, what are you doing to keep yourself, you know, cause, dude, you're cut, you're, you're buffed as hell. So like, what, well, what are you doing? <laughs> They, these, I mean, I feel like my workouts are so lame right now. Like I, I, I'm not a coffee drinker. So I used to start every single day. Boom. I was in the gym. You know, it was usually one body part per day, mm -hmm. you know, five or six days a week. Well, since the gym's closed, I've been doing the at-home workouts. My girlfriend bought us a kettlebell, which has been great for doing kettlebell swings and doing bicep curls with them. But like, I feel like my workouts have transitioned from one body part a day, like really honing in on that to these full body workouts that I, I'm going to be honest, aren't very good. Like these, <laughs> these workouts, <laughs> these workouts suck. I saw that meme where it's, uh, it's, um, I think from predator where it's, uh, they're doing like the bro handshake. Yeah. And it's like after going to the gym after three weeks of, uh, three months of quarantine and their arms are like this big and it's Arnold Schwarzenegger's <laughs> arm. Like that's what I feel like. <laughs> And that's the other thing, like, it's, it's, it's such a different mentality when it comes to trying to work out at home. Like, I, you know, my wife and I, we picked up, um, just before the whole quarantine happened, we picked up the total gym, you know, the selectable weights, uh, oh, nice. dumbbells. Like, yeah. We have those. Chuck Norris, he sold you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so we've got those, uh, we got a kettlebell, we've got, um, now I've got the, the twisting, uh, push up things and. Like I okay, work, cool. I work out at home. Like I work out every day. It's just, there's always that feeling in the back of my head. I'm like, could I push harder on that set? Like yes. I've done something more. And it's just, it's, it's a different, it's a different feeling. It's, it's just, there's being... something about, there's something about putting on your shoes, getting in your car, driving to the gym and going, all right, let's get this thing in. Like, you know, I'm giving myself an hour. Let's do this. It's so different when your workout area is four feet from the same place where you, you know, eat potato <laughs> chips and watch Netflix, you know? And I think that, I think there's a, like, there's a real like psychological thing there that like, if you're working out in the same place where you're doing other tasks in your home, it, you know, I, I think it's tough to get in a, a great workout. And I am so excited for when gyms reopen. I, I can't wait. Um, being respectful of your time, uh, we're going to wind down to the last couple questions because I don't want to keep you. I know you're a very, very busy man. I, P 
people. I don't know I, if anybody's busy during this time. <laughs> 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 but but no, you're right. But thank you. This has been great. I, I'm I'm happy to come back on the show. This was awesome. This yeah. Was a, it's a great conversation as always. Yeah, man, definitely. Uh, you know, is there, um, I guess one last question uh, we have for you is like with uh, all that you do from, you know, interviewing celebrities, wrestlers, running a podcast, you know, running a YouTube channel, is there any advice that you would like to leave the audience with before you go? Anything at all? I just think you could. Yeah, I just think you got to go for it. I think that there's too many people that are talking about making a YouTube channel, talking about starting a podcast. And that's all they'll ever do is they'll just talk about the idea of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that you just got to start doing it. And yeah. I think that it's not just do one episode and go, oh, yeah, it didn't work. I think it's like, try it once to get over the fear of it. Yeah. Try it for a second time so that you can actually like kind of get comfortable with it. And then like try it again for a third time and like, you know, actually be able to enjoy it. Uh, so I think that that's the biggest thing is if there's someone out there doing the thing that you want to do, mm -hmm. that just means that you can do it as well. And they've carved a path for you to do it. So I think that whatever it is, you know, make sure to dream big enough and go after it. Yeah, And, you know, that makes me, you know, want to speak on one of the things that, you know, you're, you're saying that you always say, and it's big goals get big results. It's so true. You know, and that that's really stuck with me for the last year since, you know, we first met and we became friends and started talking because, you know, especially for me on this YouTube journey, you know, and, and with podcasting and, you know, pursuing, you know, journalism before this whole COVID-19, I was going to be traveling to so many different conventions and working with so many different companies to cover stuff. And it's like, I'm at a point now where I've really been thinking, like, what is it I want to do? What do I, where do I want to go with my YouTube career? Where do I want to go with my, you know, my podcast? I actually started a second podcast because I'm like, I have this one where I do the interview and I have another one where, you know, we talk about, we'll take a subject and just round table it. But I just want to know, like, what is it I want to do and how can I push myself each and every day to be better than what I was? Yeah. And, you know, I really, honestly, you know, Chris, I've said it before, I'll say it again, man, you've been a huge inspiration for me and my career as, you know, a content creator, as a YouTuber, as an interviewer, you really, like, your energy, you're positive, no matter what, you know, it's, it's, thank you. I just want to say thank oh, you. Well, <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. And look, man, thank yourself. Like you're, you're the one out there doing it. You know, you, you've created these goals for yourself and you're chasing after them. And that's so cool to hear, man. And I, I can't wait to see where you're at when we do this interview again next year. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, with that being said, man, uh, tell people where they can find you. And if there's any projects you have in the works, uh, let them know. And audience, everything is going to be down in the description below. Make sure you check out his channel, Follow him on social media, and I'll shut up so my guests can say this. This feel. <laughs> well, I'm at Chris Van Vliet, which you've uh, nicely put down here. So thank you very much. Uh, at Chris Van Vliet on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, I think is probably my favorite social media platform, and of course on YouTube. Uh, and wherever you're listening to this podcast, you can find my podcast, The Chris Van Vliet Show. And let's just let's just keep doing it. Let's just yeah. keep going out there and just crushing it every day. Yeah, definitely. And uh, with that being said, everyone, you can catch this episode of the Casanova Podcast. It aired here live first on YouTube. It's uh, also going to be available later on tonight on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. Yes, people, I am reading off of it because it's in front of me, so I can see it. A whole <laughs> lot of platforms, but you'll be able to catch it on each and every single one of them. And um, if you enjoy the show, make sure you leave a rating for it on Apple Podcasts. If you like it here on YouTube, hit the like button. But most of all, what I really want you guys to do is go and sub to Chris's channel. He makes phenomenal content. He's been making phenomenal content for years. He has one of the best damn podcasts I've ever heard. You know, and that's not blowing smoke up your butt, man. I'm being completely honest. I love oh, your show. Thank you. Wow. And just the, the passion and, and the, the energy that you put into what you do. It's, it's truly inspiring. You know, and I again, I want to thank you for coming on the show and Everyone, with that being said, this is Mikhail and Chris. We are signing out. 
Each and every one of y'all stay safe, stay blessed, and have a good one. Hey, did you enjoy this episode of the Casting of a Podcast? Well, I'm sure you did. And since you did and you're wondering where else you can find it, you can find it on every podcasting outlet. Yes, it includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Launchpad DM by Podcast One, and so much more. And the only thing I ask of you is if you truly enjoyed it, even if you didn't enjoy it, please leave a rating and tell us what you thought of it, what you liked, what you didn't like, and everything in between. And also, if you're looking for video formats of this podcast and many more, you'll be able to find them on youtube.com slash Mikhail Casanova, as well as on twitch.tv slash Mikhail Casanova, and new episodes every single Monday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So, that being said, this is Mikhail Casanova, Hawaii's favorite YouTuber. I am signing out. You guys have a great one.